Daniel Kirk, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, we, met, we met kind of through a breathwork seminar that I ran here. Uh, we're at Peak Conditioning, um, run by a mutual friend, Scott, uh, Sean Baker. Yep. And uh, you were on that breathwork seminar. And I'd never met, I'd kind of seen you around with, uh, with Nexus Sport. And, uh, and I, I was kind of, one, one your height, couldn't, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't take away out. your height. Yeah, you yeah. stood out, definitely. But, um, but then you came up and we, we kind of got in touch on Instagram. And then I yeah. found out more about you, that you were going into the paras. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess there's so, many, there's so many things we could dive into straight away. Um, but I think it's easier just to kind of start back sure and hear your background in sport yeah um where you came about i know you have strength and conditioning background yeah and sort of your first sort of i guess memories of sport and, and what you were going into where your journey was heading and cool. then we'll get into the stuff later so yeah. yeah where did it kind of all start uh, for you yeah sure so i grew up in tassie um i found my way into soccer i think when i was maybe seven or eight years of age the i guess local um Friends and neighbours were, were more into that than, than AFL uh, for me. So um, I was quite keen to sort of go out and have a kick and get involved. And um, a friend of dad's uh, was quite a good coach as well. So he sort of encouraged it. And um, yeah, like I, I enjoyed that. I played it for maybe 10 years, made a few sort of rep sides. And I wasn't wasn't elite, I wouldn't say, but yeah. I played a couple of games of, of Premier League. I think it was in Tassie. Um, at a pretty you know, young age, like seven or eight, 18. And um, yeah, quite enjoyed it. Like I, I played everywhere. I started down back and moving my way up forward and then ended up back in the goals, yeah. I guess, because of my size yeah. and uh, maybe some coordination or strength at that point. Um, but yeah, look, it was, it was an interesting journey. And um, growing up quite quickly, like I, I had a few back problems um, with my sport and goalkeeping didn't necessarily help that. Uh, so... I found myself um, refereeing for a bit of pocket money and then actually taking a year off playing altogether because I was doing quite well at the refereeing, but the back wasn't really coping with the, the soccer. Um, and the discovery I made at that point was that I hated refereeing. I was far <laughs> too competitive. <laughs> right, okay. Um, I was, you know, almost like challenging myself to outrun the, the breaks in plays and stuff just because I was, you know, it just wasn't stimulating enough for me. So, um what I did then was um, made my way back into uh, AFL because I'd played one year before the break. Um, a school teacher had um, called me up after I'd gone along to some state trials with a, with a mate and made it further along than he did. Wow. Um, so that was kind of my induction into, into footy and AFL. And um, yeah, so I, at the end of that, that year of sabbatical from all sport, I went, actually, I'm, I miss footy more than I miss soccer. And um, Let's go and give that a crack. So, that's, and, that, that's and you reckon you're getting picked there? Just they've looked. Have you always been tall? Like, have you always uh, been like, yeah, yeah. I was tall, or you know, top couple in, in the class, I guess, for height. And I, I wasn't very, um, didn't have a lot on me. Like I was yeah. pretty, pretty lean, young fella. Um, it took a while to sort of get that that strength. And I generally moved okay. I think like I was always one that um, rejected that claim that big guys are, you know, they're not agile, they're not quick, they're yeah. not those sort of things. And I was like, well, why? Like, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So rather than sort of succumb to that, I'm going to challenge it and, and prove that I can actually be better at my height than what the average person can be. So what were you doing as a young... Like, if you've... Because I've met some tall youngsters and they, they, it, is, it is kind of when there's growth spurts happening, they, they move a lot less um, agile and, they're, yeah. and they're, it's harder, their coordination's harder. So did you dedicate to a training program? Did you do something that you... You're like right. I've got to. I've got to um, train a certain way and get get myself in a certain physical condition. Yeah, it was definitely self-directed. Like I didn't. You know, my parents weren't sports people. My my extended family weren't sports people. So it was something that I'd kind of just gravitated towards and, and really felt strongly about. And and that was always what I wanted to do with my spare time. Um, so I guess like I, I stretched a lot, I asked a lot of questions, I, I, I guess I modelled myself on, on people that I admired for, for their attributes about the way they handled themselves in sport. Yeah. Um, so it was more just trying to, yeah, I guess prove that it was possible rather than being told that it wasn't just a, like, you probably wouldn't be familiar with this term, not being sort of um, born and bred here in Australia, but a big dumb ruckman. Right. That's what they call the big fellas. Like, they assume that you're not very smart, that you, you're pretty slow, and you should just give it to the little fellas to do all the work. Yeah. Um, and I, I rejected that, probably to the, um, the dismay of my coaches and, and teammates because they probably did believe in it yeah. at times. Um, 
but I think along the way I probably probably proved that it is possible and um, and there's plenty of other examples out there now I think you know you've just got to look for those rather than sort of being sort of I guess stereotyped into a, a certain package and then like I said that self-fulfilling pro prophecy if you're told not to do these things or you're told that's all you are well then you're too afraid of putting yourself out there because you know the scrutiny that you cop when you do do it yeah well, was there anyone you looked up to was there any sort of like uh, inspirations <laughs> that you had it's, it's interesting because I've I've probably modeled this differently over the years like mm. Growing up, the people I admired were people like Lance Armstrong because of his perseverance. I had this same yep. thing. I, I, I came up, someone asked me that, who was, who was a role model for you? Yeah. And, and my two role models were Oscar Pistorius yeah. and uh, Lance Armstrong. I was yeah. like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, yeah, and the list goes on. Like Carl Lewis, who was obviously never yep. convicted, but there's been a lot of conjecture yep. about. Um, Marion Jones. Wow. Like, you know, like isn't I, it mad, it's mad, isn't it? It's, you have these? It, yeah, and it really makes you, you question yourself. But the interesting thing is, I guess, the power of reflection shows you that, well, once you discover those things, the, the gloss wears off and that, that yeah. they're not actually what, you know, you're admiring about those people yeah and so then you start to search for new role models and new influences and and i would say that mine are, are fairly solid now you know it's, it's people like um you know roger federer is way up there because yeah. for me it, it's character and perseverance like yeah. those are the, the two driving factors behind it like any um successful athlete that has longevity in their sport um dustin fletcher was one played for um the Essendon Bombers in AFL and just, yeah, like phenomenal, played to something like 40 years of age, like, you know, in yeah. their sport where they tell you at 30, you're done. So, you know, people like that, um, you know, um, there's, there's plenty of others. Like I really admire watching Aaron Phillips now, um, you know, Elise Perry, um, you know, Serena Williams, like just phenomenal. Like I think sometimes you get caught up in, um, only aligning yourself or only like drawing inspirations from your own gender but I think like that's that's a mistake like yeah. we're all we've all got something to teach and something to learn in life and um and there's plenty of examples out there where I'm just like you know like Lauren Jackson like just the way she carved a path for Australian females in basketball yeah um there's some fantastic examples of people that now I would draw on for inspiration and, and learning I think sometimes it's even um it's seeing the inspirations in your own life as well. Yeah, I think I think I've yeah I've fall, I've fallen to that uh, media hype of a certain athlete. Like I said, the people like your Lance Armstrongs, like yeah. pushed to the the, yeah. the nth degree through yeah. media. Um, and you look at these people and you go, brilliant! They're an inspiration at the time. Yeah. Obviously, it changes over time. And mine, I'm totally the same. My 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 inspirations, my influences in, in my life have changed. But f remembering sort of the people that are really really nearby. Yeah, they're the ones that. Um, that I can think of some people that within my own teams that I've played in and think, well, I was always trying to actually emulate what they were doing yeah, and what they were sure. doing. And, and they're sort of like these little micro inspirations yep, everywhere and totally. they add up and then they hopefully build your character into, yeah. into what you're doing. Massively important for, mm -hmm. for any young player, anyone who's trying to get into sport. And then fundamentally, those, those sort of traits build your character in life as well. Yeah. They're, they're, um, they're, you look at them and go, there's a reason why Roger Federer hasn't had like scandals in yeah. the paper he's got it together yeah. and and these people are yeah they, they're proper real real role, mo role yeah. models um so you you then jumped so you going to your story you jumped into footy yeah uh, so got into sort of something got into you footy to and that i guess took off kind of quickly for me like i i played in a um so the year the, the one year i played before the break we actually i played in the grand final for soccer and footy in the same year wow. so i won the footy one lost the soccer one it's interesting. Um, so you you were you were juggling two sports for that once. one year, yeah. How was yeah. that? Um, yeah, look, it was good. Like I just I love sport. The more I could do, the better. So yeah. I'm proud of that. I played for two soccer teams in the same same year, um, and my fitness just sort of you know elevated because of that. So yeah, it was as I was younger, more was always better. Like yeah. Um, so so yeah, got back into footy, and um, I think I played reserves and maybe a season or so and then jumped into the seniors pretty quickly and in fact it might not have been a season it might have been half a season um and it was a, it was a pretty cool club like hobart footy club and um just some good people around and um some people that really sort of gave me a bit of confidence in myself to have a go and and it was probably their uh influence that made me go and try it for the senior state side mm -hmm. um and you know surprisingly probably got a run there my skills were definitely not um, elite at that point yeah. there were some things I did really well and there was a lot of stuff that I was way below par because I just hadn't grown up in a mm -hmm. footy family or playing football and 
you know, I didn't know the terminology and at that stage of my life I was really shy and reserved. Um, and so like asking questions or being vulnerable was, was something I avoided. So you know, there'd be little things like saying getting front and square and to me I had no idea what that meant. That was not a terminology we used in soccer, we'd never sort of grown up with it. So I didn't know what I was talking about, I was too scared to ask because everyone else seemed to know. There was another one which was like um, being a kick and a half behind the play and that sounds logical, right? Like you think I've got to be a kick and a half like sort of defensively. But then if you're not sort of really thinking about it, you, you think, well, what happens when the opposition has it? Does that mean I have to be a kick and a half the other side? Yeah. And so I was busting my bum trying to get back and forth to the coaches, like frustration, thinking that I'm not doing what I'm told because I'm not being back and defensive. And I'm like, I just didn't know. Yeah. And I was too scared to ask. How did, how did you navigate that space then? Because I... <laughs> not well. Not, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But how did you... How did you... I, I was... Um, we talked... We had a little bit of conversation before this. I talked about insecurities in sport and I was a very insecure um, person as a, as a you know, teenager and um, growing up in sport. And so I was always trying to prove myself and... It's a lesson that I'm I'm still learning now, but I, I only really learned this probably in my in my thirties. And that um, you know, trying to prove yourself because of your own insecurities only makes you come across as um, yeah, adversarial. You know, like someone that's there to compete with you only, or there to prove themselves, or to beat you, not to actually sort of be with you and to and to connect and those sort of things. And that is something that I have some regret about because I feel like maybe I didn't connect with people as well because I was constantly trying to win their approval rather than just be me um, and be with them. And um, it was a little bit of a trap of, of sport for me, I guess, and just family dynamic and, and the influences I'd grown up with. But yeah, so um, I've tried to sort of be more self-aware of that now and it not be, um, yeah, like not have to demonstrate some sort of self-worth to someone because I'm feeling insecure about myself but be okay with you know I'm happy with the life that I'm living and the people that I'm around and um and it's great to be able to sort of share and and do those things with other people and I didn't know that the sharing was ever a problem that was something I felt like I was quite good at but definitely yeah. when it came to you know just trying to I don't know assert some sort of like worth to yourself like that was that was a weakness for me it's, it's um really interesting I think there's definitely a lot of insecurity within uh, not just in sport but in young people everywhere did you do you think you had the self-awareness of that insecurity did you deep down know you had it or you were just burying it and, and i knew i had the insecurity I, I didn't understand that i was constantly trying to prove myself yeah. which is a um it's a self-destructive trait i think um you know i think you know you know, family influences play a big part and growing up, if you're sort of told that, you know, it's you against the world or no one's going to do you any favours or only the kids with the, you know, um, dad who did X, Y, Z are the ones that are going to go anywhere and so you start to feel like a bit of an outcast and a bit of a loner and you have to do something a bit more special to mm -hmm. be able to achieve those things if you're not willing to succumb to mediocrity. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of where I was at and like it's taken me a long time and um, I'm lucky to have a an unbelievable partner like so grounded and um you know kind and compassionate and those sort of things but also so honest there's there's not a lot of bs in our relationship it's yeah. we generally sort of call it as it is and um and i like that like i like knowing where i stand with someone and, and being able to express myself as well and and she kim has been phenomenal for helping me kind of i guess um overcome some of this stuff and be be more grounded and self-aware with it um, she did a lot of work herself, like growing up in a different family dynamic where you know emotions weren't so easily shared, and um, and that took her a lot of time and work to to push her as well too. So I think you know together we've probably been good for each other to help each other kind of find who we are and and um, live a bit more you know in line with that. We had, we had this um, we, we talked earlier as well about our business next room. We uh, do some mindset sessions with our um, with our clients, and we talked about you know early on in your sporting career. Everyone's kind of almost um, an, an equation. They're almost like a sum of all the people in their life. Yeah. Um, so, you, and I remember this myself when I was young. I used to poll my friends and family as to when it was a big decision to make because I was too scared to make it myself. So it was like I'd go with what the majority said. At yeah. the same time, you'd be riddled with anxiety knowing that that wasn't actually what you wanted to do, but you yeah. were too scared to do it. 
And so, you know, the first step is to then become self-aware of, of those influences, those filters that you've already got that are driving you towards a, a decision which isn't necessarily in line with your values. Mm. And who is that voice in your head that's saying that when you go and say something autonomously without actually thinking about it first? Is it your voice or is it someone else that's influenced you in the past? Yeah. So, you know, developing self-awareness and then evolving that further to then it being your voice in your head rather than your partners or your coaches or whatever else so that you're, you've got full ownership of, of who you are and what you're doing. Yeah, I had this brilliant conversation with someone about the very same thing. Okay. Um, and the terminology that they used was who's <coughs> driving your bus? Yep. Who's driving the bus? Yeah, totally. Are you in control of the bus or who is someone else driving your bus? Yeah. Like you said, it, it's very small little things that the reactions you have, the emotional reactions, the way you say things. Yeah. And especially... Um, I was seeing this around positive self-talk with, with a lot of athletes, yeah. young athletes, and you go, their they, self-talk to themselves is negative, and I think that's a very common thing. Absolutely. But you also then, the parents would come and pick yeah. them up, and there would be little comments that, would, that you'd hear, and you go, I see it now. I totally see it. Yeah. There's this um, self-deprivating uh, way of, of, of looking at, yeah. child, at, at themselves, and I... I just, you can't, one, you, you want to reach out and, and say something, but I think at the same time, you just have to, uh, you, you just have to give them as much positivity as you can yeah. from where they're coming to you from. Yeah. But um, yeah, that who's driving the bus and you can see they're not driving their bus. No. They're making decisions based on what others feel they should do. And then all that you can see is a road towards probably living in a little bit of regret yeah. of, of the decisions they make because yeah. I'm not doing these decisions myself. And I think as a 30 year old now, I'm only just making some decisions yep. for myself yep. and I'm making them going because I know in the future that's going to make me happy yep. rather than it's going to make someone else happy. Yep. Uh, that's a, if, if anyone can, if a young person can grab that early on, I think it involves some very tough uh, conversations yeah. with their parents and yeah. with the people around them because yep. you're, you're, you're taking away their sense of, of um, control and almost. attachment yeah. and, and yeah, they they're sort of feeling their, their jobs being lost, I guess, and their own idea of how you want to, they want you to navigate the world. Yeah. And, and when you take that away from them, can cause conflict, yep. can cause some ugly conversations, but fundamentally, what is it that you want? Do you want to be driving your bus or do yeah. you want someone else to do it? Yeah. So that's a really, really interesting part of yeah. the, the growth of someone, not just an athlete. It, it's the biggest thing that I think an athlete can invest in at any age. There is, you know, there's always going to be fit, strong, you know, people that are skillful, talented, all the rest of it. But if you, if you haven't invested in mindset, not, you know, um, mindset and mental stuff where you think of it as being a, a weakness that you have to fix, like, you know, okay, I've got to go to the doctor because I've got an infection. It's not that at all. It's, it's the same as what you do when you go to the gym. It's the same as what you go when you go to school. You're investing in, you know, your well-being and, and your personal mm -hmm. development. Um, and, you know, the ultimate goal is to really be... Um, self-driven, self-dependent, you know, so you can operate well interdependently. So, you know, you and I can maybe achieve more than I can achieve on my own, mm. but I can actually operate independently of that and still, you know, function and do well. Um, so that if we're running a business, it's not dependent on you and I being locked at the hip to be able to do something together or if we're a partner in beach volleyball, like it's not dependent on one person or sorry, the, the, the culmination of the two people, you, you know, you bring together this sense of, um, both bring together this sense of secureness about you, which then mm. allows you to give freely and receive freely. Mm. Yeah. So we, we try and be more facilitators in what we do. Like we don't want, um, you know, those sort of people that we're talking about, those people that have got vulnerabilities and they're operating by those patterns, they're not necessarily self-aware and they're generally quite insecure and vulnerable. And so confrontation generally will push them away. Mm. Um, and so we try and be a little gentler with that. We try and, you know, like you were saying, support and encouragement. And, you know, I'm not a big believer in bringing out the stick. Like, you know, they talk about the carrot or the stick. I, I think, you know, that's a, sort of an old school mentality which says, you know, you have to be tough, you have to be seen doing the work, all this sort of stuff. And um, in my experiences and those that I've seen around me, it, it's not the m most common way to, to achieve those end goals. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's a diminishing. You're seeing less and less people succeeding that way because of the damage that it does to people mentally and emotionally. Yeah. Um, and so, we, yeah, we'd encourage those people to start taking more, you know, personal responsibility, more accountability in their lives. Like, set your life up for that. You know, set your life up with a support network so that you do feel that safety. 
you know, ultimately we, want, we need to feel safe as human beings. If we don't feel safe, then everything else is a threat. Mm. Um, and so, you know, when you, when you do that and you've got people to keep you accountable as well, like partners and friends, then, you know, you can be sure that you're not just going to play to your ego and say, that, yeah, yeah, I'm doing the work, I'm doing all right. And it's like, yeah, but are you, are you really committed to what you say you're committed to? Like, are your actions reflecting that? Mm. And if they aren't, are you willing to listen to someone, you know, to, to correct that? Yeah, um, and it's okay. It's okay if they're not. The, the one thing I've learned about sport is that people are in it for a whole host of different reasons. And if you get caught up, sort of chasing the, the talented athlete and and pushing them and tugging on them and, and trying to get them to the level that you th- they say they want to get to and you think that they should get to, you'll just get frustrated because until you understand them as a human being, what they really want, they could just be a culmination of their parents' wants and needs, of their friends' wants and Mm -hmm. needs, of, you know, the status that comes with that success and therefore people crowding around them and cheering them on for that. And they haven't worked themselves out yet. Yeah. And so the more you push and pull on them, the the, the more turmoil it's going to cause for everyone. Yeah, it's a really good point. Parents, um, I'd I'd done a podcast with Rachel Spawn. Yeah, great. And we we got into parenting what was your what were your parents like with you growing up um getting into sport yeah look mum was mum was always super encouraging she's um we got a really good relationship really understand each other um can tell her anything which is which is amazing so um you know we had three three boys in our family all playing sport at the time and she would you know pretty much the during the week work out where she needed to be and what time she needed to leave one game to the other so you know she could say that she'd seen everyone's game for the weekend and wow um, so she was phenomenal. Dad was the provider of the family, so you know it was kind of like he was somewhat invested, but maybe not all invested. I know that's a regret that he's probably carries with him now, but um, I've tried to reassure him that I understand. Like I, I know what it, that it's like when you you feel that responsibility and the stress that comes with that and the damage it can do to a relationship. And mm. um, you know, on reflection, I think he I think he did a good job. Like you know, like he got out and he did more. Um, activities with us like BMXing and stuff and helping us go and buy parts and repair bikes and build billy carts and those sort of things, you know. So mm. it, was, it was different, those, those sort of dynamics. Um, I think in terms of the way that they, um, I guess, almost coach you as a child yeah. through your sport, you know, there was probably more of that outsider t- mentality again because they'd never done it. Yeah. And t- so to them, it's, th- it's one of those things that only, only very few people get to do and, you know, you're probably not going to be one of them. And so you kind of... It's almost like a diminishing, um, I don't know, uh, language or, mm. or way of speaking about it when, you, when you're doing that. It's almost like, well, if you, if you haven't made it that maybe you should think about, you know, having a backup plan and doing something else. And, and so I kind of had to wrestle with that a little bit. For me, I always believed that, you know, perseverance and, and character um, are the things that will get you through. And I, I definitely think, like... I don't think there's too many people that would say that I don't, I'm not determined or I don't have perseverance. I think yeah. that's a, a strong characteristic of mine. And a lot of the time it helps me. There's been times when it actually doesn't. It, it does yeah. the opposite because I'm too persistent and I'm um, maybe too strong-willed with certain things and, and not able to let go as easily. But um, th- those types of characteristics, I think, are necessary. And, you know, it's not good versus bad. It's useful versus not useful because sometimes those things are going to be really helpful and you want them there and other times they're, they're not so helpful. So let's not make it so black and white. Let's just use the tools that we have. Yeah, it's, in, it's, it's real fascinating having <coughs> parents, I think, if, you, if they've not come from a sporting background and, and seeing it as a, an outsider thing. They're, yeah. they're, they're not, they have no idea how to navigate that landscape yeah. because they've never been there. They yeah. never wanted to be there. That wasn't a part of what they, their upbringing was and you can't blame them for that because no. that's just their life that they've lived. Um, you Sometimes I know I'm the same. My parents didn't have a sporting background. There was no one in my family that had a right. sporting background and, and yeah, you kind of feel a bit of a black sheep of the family almost <laughs> because you, you are trying to navigate a new space yeah. in in the in sort of the path in which they're trying to, yeah. to help you on. So... Yeah, it's fascinating. So with AFL, how was there ever a dream of playing professionally? How yeah, absolutely. Far did you, how far did you? How far did you get with it? Um, so I played. So we talked about trying it for state team. Um, I made that team in, with the seniors. Um, so I played uh, ten games a year over two years. So that's probably half the games, which is not bad at my age and, and history, I guess. Um, I'd come up on the radar of a few AFL clubs at the time. Again, I, I wasn't great at talking and sharing, and so I, I'd had a few injuries which I tried to play through, which then didn't present myself as well as I could have. 
Um, and because I was so raw and because I was at that time considered sort of an overage athlete, they were only taking 18 year olds. I was probably too high a risk, I think. Um, so there was probably a, a passing moment there, which I, I missed. Um, I made um, the trip over to SA with my partner at the time. Um, so committed to sort of coming over and playing in the SA NFL um, and starting at the same time. I felt like I wanted, again, no one in, in my immediate family had, had done uni and it was something I wanted to do and, and follow that sports pathway. And uh, so I was doing that and playing, playing football down at Glenelg Footy Club. So you um, completely left home. You, you just left and yeah. came over to Australia. Well, Tassie is Australia. Tassie is, like, <laughs> I say the mainland. Do you know yeah, what I mean? like I've seen the mainland. What, that's what we it? call it. They call it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you you came over. Yeah. What was that like? How old were you then? Uh, I'll, I'll be really honest with you. I was, so I was probably twenty twenty one. I bored my eyes out as I drove off from home because we drove over. Yeah. Okay. I just I'd never left my family before. Like yeah. I'd probably only lived out of home for a year, um, and I was. It wasn't actually that I was worried about. I don't know what. I was actually more worried about their well-being that if I went and something happened to them how would I, like I'd regret that yeah that I you know that separation anxiety I guess it wasn't that I was you know soft and needed my parents around per se it was it was just out of concern like that you know that fear of not being around for an important event or something so um my partner at the time was was really supportive and encouraging a move and um and so that was that was really helpful I think it would have been tough without that um, mm. So got over here, and I reckon within three months, I sort of knew that this is where I was meant to be. Yeah. Like I, I wasn't homesick. I was enjoying where I was. I, you know, I felt more connected with South Australia, like or people in South Australia, than what I'd probably had at least through school. I, I never really found found my way in school and felt like a, a bit of an outcast. And um, and so yeah, persisted with that, and I ended up playing eight years of footy with Glenelg Footy Club and. Um, we talked about opportunities at AFL. I, I made a couple of state teams. Um, both of them, I got injured at critical moments and, and never got to play. Um, and then there was, I got a pre-season, I think after my first year with Port. Um, performed actually quite well um, with some good feedback. We're still very raw as a footballer, mm. like skills wise. Um, and so again, was probably too big a risk. They weren't, again, weren't taking mature age athletes at that stage. There was no mature age rookie draft. It was, I think, 23 or something was the cutoff and I was a month too old wow. so um, so yeah didn't get picked up there um, went back had a change of coach didn't really respond as well as to that earlier as I would have liked um, but got better over time and the club started performing better and we started playing finals and got quite cl- quite close to the ultimate ultimate glory but missed out um, and then um, the partner I moved over with went through some stuff with and, and breaking up and kind of lost myself in that and I was just finishing a uni degree and I saw this ad about trying out for um, the London Olympics um, in kayak so you know yeah, come okay. along and, and do all your fitness testing and stuff and and I was just like I was lost at the time and I was like you know I'll just go and do it and see what happens and um, did really well like you know like all those sort of performance-based testing things are something that are generally a strength of mine and um, took up the invitation and trained in that environment sort of for four or five months and hated it <laughs> No totally way. hated it. It was it was Why just was so that? different what from was footy. Um, well, is it, was it a case of because you went from straight away team sport to an individual? Yeah, like, yeah. How was how was that dynamic to? It was to it navigate? was different. I wouldn't like I said the team sport didn't feel settled at the time. Like and, and I guess with the coach, I, I didn't feel that connected, and that's where I kind of went. Well, I'm just going to give this a go. Like I'm going to take a risk, and mm. you know, um, and so yeah, moving to Queensland left my um, my new, new partner. So I left one and. and um, uh, found another one by then, I guess. So moved on quite quickly, um, and so that was tough as well. And leaving friends behind, and um, but just the style of the program, it was I guess because you picked people so randomly from different areas, no, no sort of personality or um, you know thought process about how these people might connect, and you put them all in the same environment and basically tell them they're competing for the same four spots in a boat. Wow. And so what that did is just create a lot of competition and separation, and just. Um, you know, I was training, I think, 16 plus times a week. So I'd be on the water uh, for double sessions twice a day throughout the week. There'd be a three-hour paddle on a Saturday. Then I was doing five gym sessions. I was trying to do my own recovery because there was no massage, physio, anything else provided. And I just blew up. Like, I was yeah. like, I, ca- I can't do this. Um, yeah. I was working with um, a footy club up there to try and raise a bit of money because it wasn't – we weren't given money. We were just given sort of living and um, environment and those sort of things and training for free. 
Uh, so made a decision, yeah, come back to footy and ended up coming back halfway through the footy season, playing out the season, playing in a grand final, getting in the best players, getting invited out for another pre-season training with Port Power again. Only I wasn't registered for the draft this time because I hadn't been playing and I thought it was my time oh. had passed. Oh. So, you know... When I reflect on it, like people sort of like, oh, you know, that's rough. And I was like, it's not. That's the way my life went. Yeah. That's just what happened. And um, if I'd been good enough and early enough, then I would have got drafted. So I wasn't. I was kind of on that threshold. And, and I probably self-sabotaged a little bit because I was always trying to get to that next level and not enjoying the level I was carrying at, which is a really good standard of football in SNFL. Yeah. So there's some really important life lessons that I learned through that experience. And, and I think following that, I probably appreciated my my footy a lot more um playing as nfl and yeah um and had you know a couple of good years um there as well playing as a center half back so i sort of felt like i found my niche as a as a player there as well and yeah so that was kind of footy and i guess not not too many years later 2012 was when i when i had that um, career ending injury so yeah so let's let's get on to the injury um sort of firstly how it happened yeah and what it entailed and and what it means for you now really yeah, so it changed my whole life yeah. um, in a moment. And uh, it's such a strange thing. Like, on reflection, it, it seemed kind of innocuous. It hurt, but I'd experienced pain before. I'd had bad injuries, and you always recover. And I would usually recover quicker than most people because of my commitment to, you know, the, the rehab side of things and my knowledge of sports science. And so when this one happened, um, I remember, yeah, getting carried off the ground pretty much. Um, got to the bench, you know, again, proving yourself, oh, well, I better try and strap it because otherwise people are going to think I'm soft and I've not tried to get back out in the team and uh, out in the field and help the team. Mm. It, was, it was stupid. I knew it was really sore and I wasn't going to keep playing, but, you know, didn't listen to that. So I strapped it and tried to wait bear and was excruciating. Um, and so, yeah, then, you know, it kind of comes a process of, okay, well, yeah, we're injured, like it's ankle, so maybe it's a couple of weeks out. So I'll go to the pool every day, I'll ice it, I'll do everything you're supposed to do, and, and it just didn't get better. So I had a month um, month of conservative rehab. I'm not someone that advocates for, for surgery quickly anyway. Um, I think, you know, trying to do all the smart things first and minimise interventions um, is a much better option for longevity and support. Yep. So, yeah, did all of that. I actually was moving clubs at the time. I, I kind of finally recognised that the environment I was in wasn't the right one for me at the time and then I needed to go somewhere else to do that. Um, so I still, still went to the new club, um, which was another, I guess, good learning experience um, because where I went to, like, I never ended up playing a game. So we'll get to the um, surgeries and those things in a moment. But, um, and yet I felt totally valued, totally embraced, my opinion was worthwhile, all these sort of things that I'd, I'd felt were missing in my, in my previous environment, at least at that time, um, which was, was reassuring. And so it ended up, I became quite self-aware that it was, the only pressure was being put on me was my own, like, because I wanted to then prove myself to people again, because I was so grateful for this, I didn't want to lose it. It was this yeah. fear of, of losing that now. Um, so yeah, I, I went, um, saw a surgeon. My first impressions with him was that he was, he was kind of arrogant like and, and very cocky and I was like I, I've seen surgeons before and and I've had a bit of that vibe and I was like okay like the sports docs have, have recommended him yeah He's probably the guy to see maybe that, conf- that overconfidence is a good thing like I don't know yeah Do you try I, and I've met surgeons that like that they I've had knee surgeries where they're they're very confident in what they do and they're yeah the fact that that sometimes is reassuring because yeah. you don't want someone nervous yeah. going into what yeah. you're doing oh no I hope I'm yeah. right so yeah, it's a tough, tough one. Though. Yeah. So we went through, had the first surgery. To be honest, the first one was okay. Like I think, you know, it was, it was warranted. It was reasonably conservative in the way that they, they sort of cleaned out the joint and, and all that sort of stuff and, and reported on it. The, I felt that found the reporting was, was pretty minimal and wasn't, you know, as much as I would have liked. But, um, you know, we went through the early stages of rehab and the first couple of stages went okay. And then as soon as we started to kind of put in impact stuff back in there, it just blew up so at 10 weeks um everything regressed um quite badly went back and saw the surgeon he led me to believe that further surgery was necessary um and for me this, again we talk about regrets this is that was a fork in the road for me i think i'm not saying i would have got back to able-bodied sport before that but that second surgery i'm i'm very confident is where where everything changed they were far more aggressive with the surgery there was minimal reporting on it. again the follow-ups were poor it was being told I'd run in six weeks when there was no chance in hell that that was going to happen. Um, and then told, well, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. There's no need to come back kind of thing. Like, 
so I was kind of left on my own and um, and trying to push through and um, so I tried some other therapies I tried some um, autologous like your own blood they sort of take it out spin it down put back in a concentrate I tried a couple yep. of different variations of that PLP, therapy PLP PRP and yeah, I've had that done, yeah. Yep. which I found super effective in, in different areas of the body my ankle at the time was so chronically inflamed that I had an extreme pain response to that like a, my new 10 out of 10 pain wow um, again I'll, I'll be quite vulnerable I was I was crying I was screaming I was rolling around the floor I didn't know if to hold it or to let it go because it was it was just agony um and it happened twice because oh, wow. each time I tried oh, a different God. therapy. Um, so I ended up in the emergency room both times just being pumped full of you know, antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, like painkillers because they didn't really know what was causing that vicious pain um, to occur. Um, so we did that. So then obviously we ruled those two out. What other sort of therapies are there? They're kind of new and innovative. We looked at um, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, so we went and tried that. When they do that, they ultrasound. And so when they ultrasound, yeah. they found some more loose bodies in the back of the joint. And, you know, this is kind of one of those things when you, you know, when you're really desperate, you will take anything that's in front of you that might mm. explain or, or provide relief from the, the pain or the, the suffering that you feel like you're experiencing. Mm. And so for me, it was like, oh, that must be it. That must be the reason I'm not recovering properly and that things aren't going well. So back to the surgeon. Um, I was very wary this time. Um, I, this I is the same surgeon. Same surgeon. I remember saying to my sports docs, like, look, I'm not sure about this guy. Are you sure he's this guy to see? No, no, he's a guy to see. Like, you know, he's seen other, other people for us. And I just think my case was more complex. And, and someone that perhaps was more humble and modest might have acknowledged that and referred me on. And, and this gentleman didn't. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we went back in for a third surgery to remove those loose bodies. Um, and yeah, look, from, from the moment that the, I spoke to the surgeon afterwards, I, I knew that I was in trouble because he, he wouldn't speak verbally about it. He kept avoiding the subject. He never reported on those loose bodies. It was the only reason we went in there. Um, and he left me with a huge amount of scar tissue and thickening of the joint at the back of the joint, which hadn't been there previously. So I was pretty, pretty dejected by that point, like function in life. I'd, I'd kind of knew that footy was probably now over for me at this point. Like How I old was, were you at this point? Uh, look, I was probably 29, 30. So, you know, I was probably, like, people think you're at the later stage of the career, but given what I'd planned for, I felt like I was probably only mid, mid-career. Mm. Um, yeah, so look, it was, it was traumatic. Um, it, it was definitely um, demoralising. There was... You know, some dark moments. I, I wouldn't. There was definitely nothing, and I'll, I'll talk quite openly. I, I don't think I ever felt suicidal or anything like that. And and um, I respect people that in their experiences and you know that that may feel those sort of things. But I was lucky enough not to. But I definitely felt a, a real lack of self worth. A real, what is the point? Like my my life doesn't have meaning anymore. Like if I've achieved everything I'm going to achieve already, I don't feel like I've done enough. Mm. Um, I'm not satisfied and now it feels like it's this slippery slope through the rest of life um, and so yeah that persistence I talked about I was I was you know every day I'd come home from work once I was working again in pain mm. um, doing a pretty poor job because my heart wasn't in it and my, my emotion definitely wasn't um, was spent on the computer like googling researching trying to find out where was these cutting edge therapies in the world that were going to help me regenerate this joint yeah um, you know you talk about influences in life and role models like Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, those types of guys that invest in that sort of stuff. Like yeah. they, they'll spend, you know, thousands of dollars like, you know, traveling to Europe or going wherever they need to go to get the right treatment to, mm. to make sure that they maximize what they get out of sport. So I contacted surgeons in, in Germany, Italy, Kuala Lumpur, um, doing some great stuff like, you know, and they'd done two and four year follow-ups with like 78% success rates of return to sport and, and just came down to money and, and resources and I couldn't do it. Um, it would have cost me 21 grand for one night in hospital in Germany. Um, no follow-up care, no accommodation, no food, no support. Like, so it was just, it was off the table. So then I sort of went, well, okay, there's this strategy. Can I find somewhere in Australia that can replicate that for me? So I went and consulted a couple of surgeons in Melbourne. Um, I, actually, the guy I ended up going with, I actually saw first. And my first impression was, it was him, oh, he's a bit sort of... Um, what was the word for it? I just, I felt like he was sort of one of those, a little bit elitist, like a little bit kind of, um, you know, over, overconfident, but not cocky, I guess, but just mm -hmm. like a bit like, we're not the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like we connected. 
I went and saw another guy and the other guy goes, no, go back to him. <laughs> I was like, okay. No way. So I went back and from there on, my experience with him was outstanding. Like he was, it must've just been my own guard up, I, I think. Mm. But he was caring, he was compassionate. I remember, you know, he was willing to give it a go. Um, it didn't work out after three surgeries with him. We did stem cell assisted grafts, we did external fixers where I had pins and rods in my leg with exposed wounds for three months. Mm, we gave right. it a fair crack, but um, the one thing I remember about him is going to surgeries and, and him, you know, looking me in the eye and putting a hand on my shoulder and reassuring me that I was going to be okay. And to me, that, that, was, that was what I needed. I needed someone that, you know, was, was at least um, willing to connect with me, at least willing to sort of give things a go and, um, and yeah, I guess just try and do their job well, yeah. um, which is some, an experience I hadn't had prior to that. So that, uh, we could talk about this all day. It, it, yeah. was a, it was a drawn out experience. There was two and a half years between me ending one sport, going through all of that stuff as um, you know, someone living with what was becoming a permanent impairment and struggling to with identity and life and emotions mm -hmm. and all those sort of things to then re-entering sport as a para-athlete. And um, I met my wife after the first three operations, you know, so she's never known me as an able-bodied person. No and, way. Um, that, was, that was an important moment for us, I think, in terms of like establishing a bond and trust and, um, and her emotionally being able to cope with um, someone being quite dependent on her for a mm -hmm. period of time with the operations that were still to come. So. There's, there's so many great things that came from it, but the thing that when I talk to other people that are going through really tough times is at some point there's going to be an uptick and mm. if you haven't reached it yet, you know, you just, you're going to have to find a way to stick in there. It's all about survival and about trying to surround yourselves with the right people and, um, and find purpose again. But once you start to see that first sign of hope, that's when life will start to get better for you and, and you just need to keep searching till you find it because there's... There's so many examples of people out there in, in sport and life that have been able to do that, that it's not impossible and, you know, you, it can be done. Yeah, mate, that's, um, I mean, both a, a tragic story, but also <laughs> sort of like the back end of it is really uplifting in sort of how you view it. Yeah. How you view it, how you see it. I can tell from sort of like just the, what comes out of you is that you're, um, you're very understanding of the situation and you're very sort of yeah aware of where you stand now with it and yeah what what actually does it mean what does the injury actually mean for you now physically yeah. like what so can and can't you do i'm i'm dependent um on this orthosis or, or any other orthosis that i get custom made um to be able to function throughout the day yeah so from the moment um when i go to bed i go to bed and i use a lightweight splint so something a little bit easier sleeping but i have to have it supported when i sleep as well um and then when I go up in the morning, I'll take that off just before I have a shower. I have a shower, pop the, the brace on, and it stays on all day. Mm -hmm. um, and if so, you didn't have it, what would... Uh, I mean, constant pain, and it yep. becomes chronically irritated, which ne never settles down, which is where I was for those two and a half years before yeah. I got it. Okay. So Parasport was the introduction to what this and, and getting something made custom and, and, you know, and then accepting that I was dependent on this device now. and. But the function that it's provided me over time like, has been phenomenal. So I, I mentioned here before, my ankle was basically self-fused. It maybe moves sort of you know, mm. 10, 15 degrees if I'm lucky. Um, but it encounters sort of like physical blocks at the end of that. So it's constantly irritating itself through that. So with the orthosis, it, it leverages off a rod at the back there. There's a foot plate. So it's basically deloading the ankle to allow me to use that small amount of range I do have mm. with, the, with the least amount of stress so that I can still do things and yeah um it, it's funny like if you haven't seen people in a long time or you meet someone for the first time and they hear your story it's very much one of sympathy from them like emotionally and like i i try i don't connect with that like it's not something that i need to, to feel like someone's um sorry for me yeah 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 um because like uh, it's, it's just what happens, like it's life. I took risks, I, I played a sport that was, you know, physical contact and there's risks involved. And my biggest regret is probably trusting the surgeon over anything else, like not, not the sport and everything else and the injury. Mm. It's that I feel like maybe there would have been a better outcome had I been better advised and been able to trust my own gut at the time. But Do you reckon that that's changed your trust in people? Uh, yeah, it's definitely made me very, very wary. Of, of who you of trust, sort of just anyone and, in life? Uh, not necessarily, like, I mean, I've always, I've always had a fairly good BS filter, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of people that sort of um, 
don't live authentically. They don't, yeah. you know, they're, they're trying to overcompensate or they're telling you something because they think it's what you want to hear or they're just trying to progress their own cause in life. Mm. You know, everyone's got goals and everyone wants to sort of go somewhere. But I think, you know, and come back to business, we're always looking for the win, win, win. So it's like, you know, what can we give the client? What can we give our partners? And what can we get ourselves? And, mm. and how do all of us, you know, succeed doing that? And it, there's... I'm yet to find an example that doesn't exist. Mm. And I think that most people are so concerned with their own well-being and their own sort of wealth that they, they miss that and they think they've just got to ride on top of everyone else to be able to achieve it. Mm-hmm. So, no, I, I, I don't. I'm definitely you know, a critical thinker and I'll challenge things and ideas and look for the evidence to support stuff. But um, generally, I'm, I'm probably a quite a trusting person. And at least initially, I like to give people an opportunity to prove themselves with their actions. Yeah. So now you're training in uh, para, para athletics. Yeah. And discus is what you're going, yep. you've gone with. Yeah. And how did you select discus? So um, I got to a point where I just hit a brick wall. Like I, I'd gone so far. I tried getting back into sport through water polo, thinking that less impact, maybe I'd be able to do that. And I wouldn't be able to stand when I got out of the pool. I was in such agony. And um, there was one day um, where late 2015, I think it was, no, late 2014, where I was trying to um, walk out to the car from a pool session and I almost didn't make it. Like I was in that much agony. It probably took me, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes to make a 80 meter walk. Mm. Um, so I got in the car, I was pretty dejected. And I was like, right, it's time to accept that this is permanent. Like, and if it is permanent, then what's my next step? I need to bring the Paralympic committee. Um, I'd had colleagues um, encourage me to do that previously, suggesting that it'd be a waste just to let all that sort of sporting um, experience go, um, be gone with the, the impairment. Um, so I rang them, within a week we'd met up in Adelaide. They were offering me different opportunities with sport. And you know, we talked about finding something that I could be um, that I could enjoy as well as I could pursue further. Um, and so athletics was one of those sports was mentioned, which piqued my interest. I wanted something that made me feel strong and powerful mm-hmm. and athletic again. And I was, I had huge doubts about how it was going to be possible. I thought I was going to have to throw from a seated frame or something at that point, because just me getting from the car to the restaurant to, for the meeting was, was, you know, excruciating. So, mm. um, but they reassured me that there's, you know, this happens a lot. They've worked with a lot of people from different circumstances and just to trust, you know, the process and to get in touch with this person to, help you with this and that person get you with that and so I was getting pain assessments I was getting referrals to orthotists and um, trying to I guess understand the situation better um, and how we could manage it and and make it functional and um, I was yeah lucky enough to meet um, someone in Melbourne Darren Pereira who's been just an amazing support who makes the the orthotics Um, so he's world class like and a lot of people say that but he's actually world class like there's not many people in the world doing what he does and he's constantly innovating with his partner paul and um i was horrified when i saw my first orthosis i thought it'd be much more um inconspicuous right yeah and i was like oh, oh okay you're gonna have to people um, gonna have to see it and initially it wasn't of much use to me because it was so chronically inflamed the joint from you know that day-to-day sort of stress that it was going through but um, over time, through the support of the pain specialist and those sorts, we, we worked out, yep, it's a really crappy joint, it's going to experience pain. Um, so what we're going to need to do is settle it right down first somehow before you can get full function out of this. Mm-hmm. So um, that meant going back into a moon boot for like three months or something again. Mm-hmm. So at one point I'd been non-weight bearing for, I don't know, nine months or something in between Jeez. weight bearing and then non-weight bearing again. Um, so we did that, went back into it, and then I could start to get a little bit of function out of it. Um, and then we need to strengthen it because at that point I could barely do a single leg hip bridge without like pain. Um, and so within 12 months, like I started doing push ex- leg push exercises again. I was doing, you know, not much, but over 100 kilos on leg press. Um, and then, you know, fast forward, you know, three or four years and I, you know, deadlift close to 200. I yeah, squat over 200. You were I saying you reckon you were a better athlete now than what you were. Absolutely. Like, and because I've always you know, looked for something else that can improve. And it's, it's almost endless. Like we can constantly innovate and find things we can do better. And it might not be the the big rocks that you did when you were younger, which is usually the volume of training mm-hmm. and just the, the raw strength um, or the raw capacity of your, your anaerobic system. But um, I've, yeah, I'm stronger than I've ever been. Like I've, I've never lifted this much in my life ever as a footy player. 
um, and it's, it's necessary for my sport. So I mm. guess that's part of the motivation. But I've also learned to manage my ankle really well. Yeah. And there are times when I screw that up and I will literally have to crawl from one wound to another because I can't wait there at all. Um, but I know what to do. I need, then I need to take a couple of days off everything, clear my calendar and yep. just rest until it calms down again and then start again without sort of overdoing it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the journey for the Olympics is kind of on, I guess. Yeah, look, it and, is. And you're, you're um, going for, for 2020 this yeah, year? Yeah. Yeah, we are. So... Um, was fortunate enough to make world champs in 2017, do quite well there, PVing in discus and I did three shot put and PV in that as well, which is great. Um, the goal's always been, been Tokyo. Um, I made the world's team for Dubai last year, but missed out through some personal circumstances where I needed to withdraw at the last minute. Um, so that was unfortunate, but I was, by the time we got there, I was in career best form, um, both in the gym and, and in the circle. Um, I'm a little bit behind that at the moment. Um, you know, we spoke earlier about some. I've got a new um, yep, it's child. Um, yeah. There's some congratulations with for pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. Look at it, mate. Being a father, it it's, it puts everything in perspective. Yeah. Um, but also but takes away also, a lot of time. It, it does. It becomes your priority. Um, both pre, pre sort of them entering the world when they're still in a, a pregnancy and, and now. Um, so that's definitely the priority. But and sports still a priority but it's definitely it's got to find its place amongst everything else and yeah so um yeah i'm look i'm a little bit behind because there's some time off and those sort of things but generally like the way i look at it is well you know i'm 37 years old now like i've i've probably been in like sports since i was seven so mm. i've actually got 30 years of training behind me yep. it's not about the last four months it's mm -hmm. about what i've learned over that time and how i can continue to innovate and be smart about the way i train so I've changed some things to be able to do that um, and I'm really investing in, okay, I've got to prioritise, I've got limited time now, so I'm going to have to do more throws training, not necessarily more volume, but more frequently um, and definitely train smarter there. Maybe actually pull back a little bit from gym because I, can, I know that I can tap back into that strength quite quickly. I'm not weak at the moment, I'm just not peaking. Mm. Um, but if I don't get the technical side of things right, I'm not going to be able to transfer that strength anyway. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's going to be tight. I'm definitely going to have to qualify later in the period if it's going to happen. Um, but we've got until till June, so it's definitely not off the cards. I've thrown some numbers before, which um, are competitive enough to at least get me considered. Yeah. Oh, mate. What then? What um, the next few months are going to be really exciting. Yeah. Both at home and yeah, yeah, totally. And um, doing that. So best of luck for that. But I think. So listening to everything that you've been talking about, there's this huge culmination of like what you've looked like you said over the last 30 years of the training yeah. that you've put in and, and the culmination of now what you're doing with, with Nexa. Yeah. And I've seen you with a lot of the kids here. You do some really cool stuff with yeah. drills and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I know your outlook is not just about the sport and it's not just about them as an athlete. Yeah. You take a much more holistic approach, which is something I'm a huge fan of. It's yeah. what I put into my coaching, mentoring and teaching and things yeah. like that that I that I definitely understand through my own experiences and of what these kids are going to go through, yeah. that it, the sport is a, a part of what, what it yeah. is. Talk, us, talk, us, talk about like, sort of how Nexa came about, yeah. um, what, it, what it is, it's your philosophy of it and, and where you kind yeah. of see it going. So Nexa was, um, I guess, born out of an idea that there was three of us at the time that were involved in business, Todd, Ben and myself. Um, and it was actually the, the idea was pitched to me from from Todd and Ben, and I'd been doing my own stuff for a, for a long time, and um, and probably had I wasn't innovating, I'll be honest. Like I was just doing it as a, as a side hustle and, and enjoyed the little bit that I did, but was teaching more and stuff. So when those guys came to me and started talking about this business, which was values based, was about um, developing people, not just athletes, and making the athlete the centre of that. Um, service or that, that community rather than being um, a, a combination of egos surrounding them sort of building their own kind of resume mm -hmm. um, it piqued my interest I was yeah. like okay like I already admire you guys and I, like the way that you're talking like I connect so strongly with that so um, yeah so I went in with those guys and um, we built Next up based on that sort of I guess Nexa comes from next generation, next generation athlete, but it's not, that doesn't mean that it's kids. Like, mm. It means that like we're training you in a way that is different to what has been done previously. We're mm. doing it in a way that attends to other areas that 
um, are so important to your sport, but also to your life in terms of developing as a person. Um, and so, yeah, so we work from people with, I mean, I think our youngest athlete at the moment is eight and our oldest is 44 maybe. Right. Um, we work from people from, you know, common sports like AFL and netball and basketball and those things to free diving. Yeah. Um, and pole vaulting and all sorts of different stuff. So, um, yeah, it's great. And what you were saying, we, what we've wanted to do is make sure that we capture more people. So with sport, you tend to have this thing where if you don't make it by a certain age, you drop out or... Um, if you lack, you know, I guess guidance or direction and you get the wrong advice at the wrong time, then that can sabotage those opportunities as well. Mm. Um, and so we've tried to kind of be a, um, I guess a, a facilitator for providing an environment that is both high performance and is, um, is welcoming. It's a community. It's a fa- it's our family. We call it our Nexa family. Yeah. Um, so it's about building each other up. It's not about sort of trying to step on someone else to reach your goals and learning from each other and, we, we play those games to, for two reasons, because we don't want training to be a grind. If Ben, Todd and myself learn anything through that, um, our years and, and all of us probably narrowly missing the, the peak of sport, like we've all achieved great things in our own right, but probably all just fallen slightly short of, of some of the things we wanted to achieve, mm. um, was that you, know, you need the right support at the right time and, um, and you need to feel like, you, you need to keep that joy that, that, mm. that starts you off in sport. Like, that's the thing that, that keeps it alive. That's the thing that other people can feed off, that you'll feed off, and um, it only sort of strengthens what you're going to do. And when we turn sport into this sort of structure and routine and grind until you just got to push through it, you got to push through the pain, you got to push through the discomfort, you got to push through whatever, um, because someone else is working out there harder than you, uh, it's, it's not right. We, we, we diminish people's enjoyment of what it is and they lose the passion. And we know if you're not passionate, you're not invested in what you're doing. And so everything falls apart. And then we go, why? Why isn't it going yeah. the way we want it? So with Nexa, we, we do a lot of game-based stuff. We have yeah. a, a youth squad, it's predominantly game-based, but with a lot of um, movement patterning stuff and, um, and challenges. We do strategic games to make them think about the decision-making and those types of things as well. Um, with our open squad, we do... Um, we do an introductory game as part of their warm-up. Again, just so sort that of interaction and bonding. But everyone, although these, these people work in groups, they work in small ratios with the coach. Everything that we do with our open squad is individualised. We do full movement and postural assessment and screenings. They get individualised programming, screening, monitoring, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. We, um, we run like little sort of communication hubs with their coaches and um, service providers to make sure everyone's kind of on the same page and and sort of staying up to date on what's happening in, in their programming cycle um, because people just don't have time. The physio doesn't have time to come down to the gym if they're not working on site. The coach, you know, is working a full-time job outside of, you know, what they do. So mm. trying to connect those people is, is helpful as well. Um, and then we run mindset sessions and stuff as well where um, we're trying to, I guess, again, facilitate that learn, create a learning space without pushing information into people mm. because you need to be ready. Like I've probably heard... You know, lots of great quotes or advice early on in life, and if you're not ready, you just don't absorb it. Like mm. it's it's almost like you're deflecting it because it doesn't you don't connect with it. And then years later, you're like, oh, hang on, I actually have this recollection of hearing this before, but it was slightly different, or I wasn't in the right space, yeah. and, and I didn't understand what it meant. So yeah, just each person learns at their own rate, I guess. But we're we're at least facilitating a learning environment for them to accelerate that process and and sharing some of our own stories and and those of our athletes in that yeah um so yeah so like it's for us it's like we love it like and we talked about priorities before and it's amazing like business and work for me had always been quite low on my priorities this it was always to facilitate other things in life that i enjoyed whereas now it's it's right up there it's it's something i I really care about because i work with a great business partner a great sort of family of athletes that we we work with and we get to all share in each other's experiences you know we all celebrate when one of our athletes does well so yeah mate it's a lovely blend of of there's that performance aspect because i have seen you doing some of the testing as well on them yeah. and, and you'd mentioned that was something that even piqued your interest as a as a youngster that testing was something yeah. you you sort of felt you were good at yeah um and that obviously has clearly gone into the business but yeah. then that beautiful blend of of uh yeah the holistic apro- approach to to the to the whole program yeah. and understanding an athlete for yeah for who they are it's something i'm taking into what i do and it's it's it's, it's so vital like yeah. navigating the entire athlete they're just more than just the the athlete yeah. and um yeah yeah it's, it's it's amazing mate we've been 
chatting for an hour and, and <laughs> well, yeah this is gone yeah gone, okay. gone really quick um look i know you've got some you've got a podcast of your own to, yeah to go and get to yep you were talking about that sort of launching tell us a little bit more about that and and yeah what um what sort of your the the approach to who's going to be on there and, and yep. what's what's in so store. It's, it's uh it's called Nexus Sports The Athlete Life. Um so you can find it on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. Um you know, it's something that we started as kind of a side project again to offer more resources to our athletes to try and get a little deeper in some of those conversations, much like you and I today, where it's not just the fluffy stuff. It's not about how many medals you won and what was the biggest event you've ever competed at. It's what was the greatest hardship you've gone through within your career and mm. what were the lessons that you learned and you know when did you feel like giving up and, and what was the catalyst for, for not and, and pushing through and, and getting to where you are now. So mm. that was kind of the, I guess, the motive for, for starting it. So I'll be honest, the, the, you know, some of the episodes are a little raw because mm. I'm, I'm learning, um, mm-hmm. you know, so... But I think there's there's some really valuable information in. So we we've, we've already got six episodes that are live. Um, I've got another four which are, we've already recorded recently, which will go up soon. Yep. So we'll, we're going to do sort of season two of another six episodes. Um, but we're kind of evolving it a bit. We started off with just athletes and um, and some great some great stories, like mm. some really cool stuff um, where I was just constantly learning, which is awesome. Um, but now we're doing sort of like industry panels and stuff where we talk to other strength and conditioning coaches and sports scientists and physios and um, still talking to athletes and, and those sort of things as well. But trying to hit, I guess, all the different areas that are involved in, in high performance and those daily training environments so that people can really start to grasp what, what it takes and, yeah. and what, they, what they're going to need to plan for if they're going to achieve what they say they want to achieve. Because there's a lot of people out there that say, I'll do anything to get where I want to go. And they've got no concept at all of, of if that's your goal and you're here, like what you need to at least know the first three steps towards that. And mm. the problem is they're focused on these last couple of steps. Um, and if you get these, those first fundamental steps wrong, you know, you, the, the difference in terms of your trajectory is profound. So, yeah. yeah so we're just, it's a free resource and we're, we're trying to offer that to people and we learn through the process. And um, I guess, you know, when we talk about what you, what motivates you in life I, I love learning like I love mm. constantly refining things and finding ways to do things better and so yeah that's that's an opportunity for me to do that while sharing those experiences with other people yeah and your own personal journey people can find you on Instagram it's, yeah so uh, at Daniel underscore Kirk uh, no at Daniel Kirk Oz so um, AUS yeah so um, and that's the same on yeah Instagram Facebook Twitter and Nexus Sport is on there as well yep and that's just at Nexus Sport and we're yeah we're on um Facebook, Instagram, TikTok now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. Watch out. Got to go, um, be into TikTok. And, and LinkedIn as well. So, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Mate, it's been, um, it's been really, like, we could have chatted for ages. Easy. Um, but I understand, <laughs> understand that you've got to be somewhere. And Thanks, um, I really appreciate your time. Peak is, you're here with Peak. And yeah, shout out to Sean for, yeah, for absolutely. this, for this space. And uh, it's an absolute hub of activity down there. There's been some basketball. There's people in the gym. It's a it's a yeah. great facility here yeah. for you here. Like in um, yeah, we're very fortunate Adelaide. to share the share the space with them. So. Yeah, so many different resources. He's ever evolving this place. So if yeah. people are ever in Adelaide, get down to Peak because um, it's one hell of a spot. But uh, Daniel, thanks so much, mate. And thanks, mate. Uh, and it. have a great few few months now leading up to to your journey. Terrific. Cheers, mate. Thanks, bud. Thanks. <laughs>